Now, <clears throat> I have to tell you, as I, uh, as I begin this morning, um, I have lost weight on the Daniel plan. Some of you have said something to me about that. That's great. That's fine. It's, I, uh, I've been doing this since the beginning of the year, and uh, I'm very grateful for our group that meets every Monday, uh, you know, except this last Monday we couldn't meet, but um, I, I have now plateaued in my weight loss, and the, the time has come for me to actually add another element to this if I want to continue to lose weight. Exorcism. I mean exercise. <laughs> It is just so hard to find the motivation to, to exercise, you know? I, 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 I know that I need to firm up. I know that I need to get my body in shape. It's just been very difficult to find a way to sustain interest in doing that. So if I'm not interested in how my body is doing... I am certainly not that interested in maintaining, um, you know, some kind of interest in the way that your body is doing. And that really sums up human nature. In fact, some people almost seem to enjoy if someone else's body is not doing as well as theirs is. Did you ever hear the story about the little kid that went up to his grandpa and he, he said, Grandpa, can you make a sound like a frog? The grandpa said, well... Well, sure I can, but why? The little kid said, well, Daddy said, when you croak, we're all going to Disney World. <laughs> now, that is taking an ungodly delight in somebody else not doing too well, and I can forgive that little kid. But I'll, I'll tell you what's, what's very difficult to forgive. That is the attitude of some Christians that take delight in another church body not doing so well. I have known Christians to actually take delight in some other church body somewhere that is struggling and declining and in poor health. I can't think of anything that is further from the spirit of the Apostle Paul than that. He had a, a love affair with the church because he had a love affair with Jesus. This old missionary, he loved every church he ever met. And let me tell you something else. He loved a lot of churches that he had never met, like the church in Colossae. And he never stopped praying for the firming up of the body. Let me show you what I mean. In the second chapter of Colossians, you're going to need to read this from your own Bible. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in the very first verse, we read these words. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, the first thing I want you to notice in this text is how passionate Paul is for brothers and sisters in Christ that he has never met. Now, just be honest with me. Sometimes we don't care for brothers and sisters in Christ we see all the time. And here, Paul is saying that he's struggling for them. And he has never even met them. Do, do you do that? Can you, can you think of a, of a church somewhere in the world in, in a place that you've never been to and you think about that church all the time? Can you think of, of some Christians in, a, in another part of the world and you can't even put a, a face to a name, but 
They constantly have a place in your heart. Paul said he wanted them to know how much he was struggling for them. How can he struggle for them if he is in Rome in prison and they are in Colossae 500 miles away? That word struggle is Paul's favorite word in the Bible for prayer. Look what he says in Romans chapter 15, verse 30. He says, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Look what he says a little later in, in the book of Colossians chapter 4. He says, Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. And that word translated wrestle or, or struggle, it, it literally means to agonize. That's the word that Paul uses. I, I want you to know, even though I have never met you, he tells him in Colossae, I'm absolutely agonizing in prayer for you. Now, how could he do that? You can chain a body, but you cannot chain a prayer. And they could not stop Paul from his ministry of intercession for churches. So I want you to write this down. A church body cannot firm up without prayer. You can't see a church grow up firm up, get strong, unless somebody is wrestling and praying for that church. And we tend to individualize the, the Christian faith. We, we take great texts from the Bible that are written to the church and we make them about us as individuals. We want to hermitize the Christian faith. Paul won't do that. All of the you's in Colossians, that word you, are all plural words. He wants all of you to be careful about deceptive doctrine. He wants all of you to be rooted in Christ. He wants the church to grow up and live in Christ. He's praying for the church. He doesn't just give the church his words. He gives the church his tears. And his prayers. He could not remain unmoved by the thought of a flabby, unfit church. He wanted the body of Christ to grow up and be strong and firm in the faith. Look again at, at the first verse of chapter 2 from the message. Not many of you have met me face to face, but that doesn't make any difference. Know that I'm on your side, right alongside you. You're not in this alone. What churches do you pray for? And I'm not talking about token praying. I'm asking you, what churches do you struggle and wrestle for so that they will actually grow up and be firm in the faith? Back in the year 2000, a, a now debunked uh, urban legend is probably what it would be. But it's a story that appeared in emails, it appeared on the internet, and, and many people took it to be just gospel truth because it's on the internet. But it's a story of a man named George Turkelbaum. The story went around that, while well, he was a proofreader at a New York firm, and while he was at his desk, he had a heart attack. There were 23 other co-workers in his office that were with him. And apparently it wasn't noticed that George Turkelbaum had died for five days sitting at his desk. As I said, the story was actually debunked. It did not happen. Not that the Internet didn't try to make it a true story. But, but it makes me wonder if it's true in churches. If the body of Christ starts to get weak and sick and close to death, nobody really notices. Nobody really cares. There are churches all around struggling and nobody is struggling for them in prayer. Now I hope we can do something about that today. I, I want you to start being a prayer wrestler for churches including our own.
Now, what does a firm up prayer look like? Well, let's just do what Paul did and pray the prayer that Paul prayed. There are three things to pray for churches. First, write this down. Pray that our hearts will be full of the love of Christ. Look at, look at verse 2 in Colossians 2. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. We need to pray what Paul prayed, which was first prayed actually by Jesus himself in the garden and the night before he died. Look at John chapter 17, verse 23. Jesus prayed, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. We don't even pray that. We need to. We, we sing about it. I mean, sometimes we, we sing the song at, at the end of our services. We'll sing, bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with, with bonds and chains that cannot be broken. Bind us together with love, we sing. Is it just a song? We're just like the church in Colossae. In Colossae, people were, were coming in with these new philosophies, and they were actually breaching the fellowship of the church, trying to, to separate Christians. And the same thing is happening today, and we need to be on guard against that. Satan is constantly going to try to divide and, and separate the church. So we have, we have got to be praying against that. We, we've got to be asking for God's help to, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the church. And maybe the place for you to start in praying for more love of Christ in this church is to pray for more love of Christ in your heart. Do you love the church? Now, wait a second. I'm not talking about some idyllic church that never actually existed. I, I'm, I'm talking about a, a church just like ours where a lot of people don't show up on daylight savings time. Because let me, let me tell you something. The only church that has ever existed has been a church that had flaws and warts. When the Bible says that Jesus loves the church, he does not just love the ideal. He loves the church as it is. All of its mistakes. You say, well, I'd love the church more, but there are some people in the church that make it very hard to love. Let me, let me just be honest. You don't love the church predicated on the people that are in it. You love the church because of the one who died for it. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, Be imitators of God, therefore, as, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Several years ago, there was a, a very popular romantic comedy that did very well in the, in the box office. It was called Sleepless in Seattle. The unique thing about that movie is that the two lead actors, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, they, they actually do not appear in a scene together in the movie until the very end of the movie. Now, when it came time to film that climactic scene, the producer of the movie, Rob Reiner, he, he said that he went to Tom Hanks, and this is what he said to Tom Hanks. He said, now, Tom, this scene that we're going to film on top of the Empire State Building, it's not about you. It's all about Meg. So let, let Meg be the focus. And then he went to Meg Ryan and he said, hey, Meg, now this, this final scene, this scene is not about you. This scene is all about Tom. So when you go in there, I want you to, I want you to make Tom shine. So if you watch that movie and, and they're meeting in the final scenes of the movie on top of the Empire State Building, one of the things that makes that, that movie just work is that you have these actors who are literally putting their egos aside and they're trying to make the other person the star. Something like that is supposed to happen when you come to church. It's not about you. It's, it's about Jesus. It's about us. It's about, it's about others. And, and we would have fewer struggles with each other if we would struggle more for each other in prayer. Asking God to give you 
the same blessings that I want him to give me. Let me tell you something. When, when our hearts are full of the love of Christ, not only do we live in unity, but, but you know what else we do? Look, look, we live in truth. Look at verse 2 again. My, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. Do you, do you see what he is saying? He is linking your capacity to love with your capacity to discern spiritual truth. In other words, Paul wants you to be full of love so that you will be able to understand spiritual things. You need to understand Paul is implying that if your heart is not filled with love for your brothers and sisters in Christ, then you cannot understand the truth. Don't tell me how much truth you know until you show me how much love you have for your brothers and sisters. God has designed it so that his revelation of himself is in cooperation with your ability to lay down your life for each other. You learn about God not in some ivory tower separated from your brothers and sisters. You learn about God as you lay down your life in sacrificial fellowship. As, as you are loving your brothers and sisters, you have more ability to understand God's love. It's like this, this circle. The more you love each other, the more you understand the love of God. The more you understand the love of God, the more you love each other. And it works together that way. Paul says he prays that we will be united together in the love of Christ so that we can understand spiritual things. That is a prayer we need to pray. That is a prayer we need to pray right here in this place so that we would be filled with the love of Jesus. Secondly, write this down. We need to pray that our minds are full of the wisdom of Christ, our, our hearts full of the love of Christ and our minds full of the wisdom of Christ. Have you, have you been to bookstores and you've seen the whole dummy book craze? I mean, they've sold over 50 million of these dummy books, computers for dummies, gardening for dummies, cooking for dummies. There's even a book, Lawyering for Dummies. Put your own joke into that one. But you know what they do not have? They do not have a life for dummies book. Where do you go to find out how to make life work? That's why we have so many cults. That's why we have so many philosophers, so many gurus when you turn on the TV. They tell you how life works. And Paul says that is exactly what he's worried about. Look what he says in verse 4 again in chapter 2. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. The wisdom of men is just foolishness to God. If you are looking for answers to life and how to make life work, well, where do you turn? Look what he says in verses 2 and 3 again. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. And knowledge. You see, what is still hidden to the world is now accessible to every believer. Do you, do you understand something, Christian? Do you understand that you ought to actually be living a rich life? This treasure is available to you that is not available to the guy that is on the street that does not know God. You have now a capacity to think a new way. And to be a rich person because of it. The treasure of God is, and the treasure, the treasure of who God is, and the treasure of who man is, and the treasure of how life is to be lived. You don't find that in human wisdom. You don't find those things chasing advanced degrees from some higher learning institution. Paul said you find true wisdom about life in Christ. Look at verse 3 again from the Good News Version. He is the key that opens all the hidden treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. Christ grants to you and to me a, a whole new worldview. As Christians, we don't think like other people think. 
We have a different worldview. We, we look at life. From a completely different perspective. We, we look at the question of life from the view of ultimate reality. God says, love me with all your heart. But he also wants you to love him with all of your mind. Learn to think like a new person. You know what we do? We, we come in here on Sunday mornings and we sing some songs to Jesus. We pray some prayers to Jesus and we go out there on Monday and we turn all that off and we turn on the world's wisdom. I was on a radio show just this past week and a caller called into the show and he said to me, he says, I respect your views, pastor, but, but I live in the real world and I've got to be pragmatic about how I approach things. That's what the world thinks. They think, you know, all this stuff you do on Sundays, that's good. But Monday's coming. And we've got to be practical. We live most of the week thinking like most of the people of the world think. Paul says, you know what that is? That is poverty. You have the riches and the wisdom of the knowledge of God in Christ to be able to live by. I'm afraid our choices often reflect a lack of confidence we have that Jesus actually knew what it was that he was talking about. Think about it. Jesus said that a, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus, do you really know what you're talking about? I mean, it says right there on TV that the quality of a man's life depends on the quality of his investments. And I think that sounds wise. Jesus says, if you want to be the greatest, you should make yourself the least. Do we believe that? Because the world says, if you want to be the greatest, go and be the greatest. That makes sense to me. We, we turn off Jesus and we live most of our lives by a value system and a kind of thinking that is totally ungodly. I'm asking you this morning a basic, simple question. Do you think when it comes to living life that Jesus had a clue about what he was talking about? I want to read to you an excerpt from my book entitled The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard. He said, our commitment to Jesus can stand on no other foundation than a recognition that he is the one who knows the truth about our lives and our universe. It is not possible to trust Jesus or anyone else in matters where we do not believe him to be competent. We cannot pray for his help and rely on his collaboration in dealing with real life matters we suspect might defeat his knowledge or abilities. And can we seriously imagine that Jesus could be Lord if he were not smart? If he were divine, would he be dumb or uninformed? Once you stop to think about it, how could he be what we take him to be in all other respects and not be the best informed, the most intelligent person of all, the smartest person who ever lived? That is exactly how his early apprentices thought of him. He was not regarded as perhaps a magician who perhaps only knew the right words to get results without understanding or who could effectively manipulate appearances. Rather, he was accepted as the ultimate scientist, craftsman, and artist. The biblical vision of Jesus is one who made all of created reality and kept it working, literally holding it together. And today we think people are smart who make light bulbs and computer chips and rockets out of stuff already provided. He made the stuff. Small wonder then that the first Christians thought he held within himself all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus knew how to transform the molecular structure of water to make it wine. That knowledge also allowed him to take a few pieces of bread and some little fish and feed thousands of people. He knew how to transform the tissues of the human body from sickness to health and from death to life. He knew how to suspend gravity, interrupt weather patterns, and eliminate unfruitful trees without a saw or an axe. He only needed a word. Surely he must be amused at what Nobel Prizes are awarded for today. 
In the ethical domain, he brought an understanding of life that has influenced world thought more than any other. And one of the greatest testimonies to his intelligence is surely that he knew how to enter physical death, actually to die, and then to live on beyond death. He seized death by the throat and defeated it. Forget cryonics. All of these things show Jesus' cognitive and practical mastery over every phase of reality, physical, moral, and spiritual. He is master only because he is maestro. Jesus is Lord can mean little in practice to anyone who has to hesitate in saying Jesus is smart. He's not just nice. He's brilliant. He is the smartest man who ever lived. He always has the best information on everything and certainly on the things that matter most on human life. Paul is saying that we are supposed to live the rich life. And the tragedy is that we live out there in poverty, turning off our spiritual brains, thinking like the rest of the men of the world think when all the riches of the wisdom of God are available to us in Christ Jesus. That's what we need to pray for this church. That's what Paul prayed. Look at verse 9 again from Colossians 1. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I don't want this church to live in poverty. Do you? I don't want us to try to make life work depending on the vain speculations of men that don't even know God. I want you to join me in praying that our hearts will be full of the love of Christ and our minds will be full of the wisdom of Christ. And finally, pray that our lives will be full of the life of Christ. Look again at at what he said in Chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him. The Good News Version says, keep your roots deep in Him. Build your lives on Him. Now, Paul raises a very interesting question here. He says, just as you received Christ, continue to live in Him. Well, Paul, do you mean it's possible to receive Christ and not live in Him? Apparently so. Apparently it is possible to confess Christ, to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then live like you never did that. I think that explains why there are so many empty Christians in flabby churches. I want to show you something very interesting, and we're going to talk more about this verse in a few weeks, but I want you to look at Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10 with me, and notice the word fullness is used twice in these verses. For in Christ... All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you've been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Now he says all the fullness of God lived in Jesus, and now all of the fullness of Jesus lives in you. The problem is we believe that first part, but we don't believe that second part. We believe that all of the fullness of God lived in Jesus, That that at Bethlehem, God was incarnate. We've got pure doctrine, but we've got empty lives. We don't live filled with Christ. Do you know churches like that? Doctrinally pure, spiritually empty. I'm going to tell you a strange story, but I want you to hang with me as I tell you this story, because I do have a point in telling you this story. March 2001, little town, Fruita, Colorado. They unveiled a new statue to a four-foot-tall, headless chicken. You know why? Well, it was a tribute to their most famous citizen, Mike the Headless Chicken. Let me tell you the story. Back in the 1940s, a farmer named Lloyd Olson was hungry, so he went out into his yard and got a rooster. And he was going to cut his head off. And the rooster's name was Mike. He was going to have supper that evening. He was going to have chicken. Well, as he wanted to save as much of the chicken's neck as he could, he cut the head off as close to the head as he could. The head rolls off. The chicken starts running around. Didn't die. 
After a while, Lloyd felt sympathy for the bird. He started to feed the bird with an eyedropper. One week later, still very perplexed, he took this headless living rooster to the University of Utah where they studied it and they decided that he had cut the head off so close there was enough of the brain stem that it was still intact that this bird was able to live without a head. Mike became famous. Mike the rooster without a head was on the cover of Life magazine. It was in the Guinness Book of World Records. Lloyd started to travel the country with Mike the headless rooster. The story does have a tragic ending. Mike choked to death on a kernel of corn in a hotel room in Arizona. So in the year 2001, 40 years after Mike had uh, had his stay on this earth, they remembered the most famous thing that ever happened in the little town of Fruita, Colorado. Here's my point. I see churches running around, staying busy, being hectic, not connected to the head. That's what Paul says can happen when you don't pray for a church. They will forget where their life actually comes from. That's why over and over again, if you read through the book of Colossians, Paul says that Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Don't get disconnected from the head. Just as you received Christ, live in him. Draw your nourishment from Christ. Let's be a church that depends on Christ for everything we do, not on ourselves. That means that we are praying to be a spirit-led church, a spirit-filled church. Years ago, some men were trying to have a campaign in their city, and they were, they were trying to decide as a group of preachers who they were going to ask to come and, and preach. Some of the older men in the group decided we should have D.L. Moody come. But a younger preacher didn't like the idea. And he said, you know, you guys talk like Mr. Moody has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. Well, there's an awkward silence amongst this group of preachers. And finally, an older preacher stood up and he said, son, Mr. Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. And I want the Spirit of Christ to have a monopoly on this church. And I want you to join me in praying that our church will be full of the love of Christ, will be full of the wisdom of Christ, will be full of the life of Christ. And I want you to pray that for other churches as well, not just ours. And a way to get very practical about this is for next week for you to participate in this unity service that we're going to go to with six area churches at the state fairgrounds. If unity was important enough for our very Lord to pray about the night he died, it's important enough for us to go to this service next Sunday and be an answer to his prayer.